I want to talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the discourse on inequality. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is uh, writing uh, a little bit before uh, Immanuel Kant, um, but his ideas really come to fruition maybe a little later in the in the uh, in the in the century in which they live, the 18th century, especially in the French Revolution. Uh, so I'm not arranging things here in historical order. I'm, I'm arranging them more thematically um, and trying to put things together in such a way that we're going towards uh, an understanding of Marxism. And, and then of course we have Dussel that we're, we're trying to attack. Okay, so, all right. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, writes the Discourse on Inequality in 1755. And he too talks about a state of nature. And, uh, but his state of nature now is something uh, quite different than what we've seen before. Uh, of course, with uh, Hobbes, you have a state of nature in which it's war. Uh, the state of nature is a war of all against all. It's sort of an utter chaos, um, uh, violence sort of situation and the social contract is established in order to get out of that chaos. We have uh, Jean Locke who talks about uh, the state of nature. He envisions something a little more, uh, uh, much more peaceful and that, uh, you know, especially when there's not a lot of people, you know, when a world population is relatively low, that there's plenty of land so that people can just move away and homestead their own property and then defend it for themselves. But once the world gets heavily populated, then it does get um, somewhat chaotic and one has trouble defending one's own life, liberty and property themselves. But, uh, and then enters into the social contract in order to make the defense of property uh, life, liberty, and property um, more feasible and to give people uh, uh, the social legal right to life, liberty, and property. Okay. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the Discourse on Inequality does a state of nature that's kind of like the opposite of Hobbes where, where for Rousseau, the state of nature is like a state of total peace. And what he envisions is um, a very, and, and, and let me say that this is just a thought experiment on his part and he explicitly says so. He's not, he isn't claiming that he believes this is what actually happened, but it is a, a thought experiment or a, a, a narrative, a myth to explain what he means by by uh, liberty. And so what he sees as the state of nature is a state of absolute liberty. Um, and he envisions an ancient past of human beings that is really pre-human, uh, where uh, he's thinking of, um, and this is, you know, 100 years before Darwin, but he's thinking kind of in evolutionary terms and thinking of primitive human beings as being somewhat like uh, Homo erectus, uh, not particularly intelligent, not self-conscious, uh, but looking very much like a human being, but kind of brutish, uh, animalistic, and um, and uh, he sees the existence of these very primitive, what we would call. Uh, humanoid, uh, proto-human, you know, before Homo sapien, uh, he sees them as being loners. So uh, he, he concocts a, a mythical creature, something like a cross between Homo erectus and a lone wolf uh, that lives, you know, um, an isolated existence, except for when, you know, when they're is 
uh, you know, sexual intercourse or something like that. But for the most part, he's thinking of, uh, of, a, of a humanoid who is living a solitary existence and living off the land, just collecting nuts and berries and maybe doing some hunting, but relatively really vegetarian and just living up the abundance of, of the world and, and communing with nature. So it's a very romantic uh, kind of picture of early humanity. And he thinks that in this state of isolated uh, communing with nature that these early uh, humanoids felt no anxiety, there was no fear of death, you know, they didn't really conceive or worry about death, they lived by instinct, uh, again, very animalistic, no self-consciousness, um, and there's no basis here for Hobbes's um, version of the social contract because there's no chaos. Um, you can always just, you know, run off into the wilderness and, and live off of your, of your, on your own and commune with nature and, and be free of all social uh, ties. Uh, there's no basis for property uh, either because the natural state here is to be isolated and wandering and not to settle down and not to, uh, you know, fence off a piece of property and till the soil and all that. Um, so, uh, there's just not this competition amongst these humanoids. Um, and part of why he says there is like the, not this competition and not this warlike atmosphere is that there's a natural pity that human beings have uh, for other, for animals and also for other human beings. And so there's a natural inclination not to fight and not to kill and things like that. And there's this, this really open sort of freedom of liberty and equality amongst human beings. Uh, now he does say that at some point, um, this humanoid does become um, self-conscious to the extent that it it develops a self-love, uh, the love of oneself, I'm more proper. Um, but is it a love of, uh, it's a little ambiguous what this stage of development is in his story, it's kind of kind of vague. Um, and maybe it's just a love of the body, like one's bodily integrity and taking care of one's bodily needs, uh, but still communing with nature and living off the land and, and having a self-sufficiency, maybe not the, the bliss of a totally unconscious instinctual humanoid, but we have something like uh, an actual human, like Homo sapien, but is still a lone wolf and, and uh, but has some sort of sense of, a personal integrity that they defend against uh, infringements upon that. Okay, and and maybe this develops when uh, people start to congregate together, and as people congregate together, he sees them starting to sort of just be forced into contact with one another uh, through evolutionary history. That that's where this. Um, this amor propra uh, arises from because once you get in close contact and regular contact with other people, then you have to defend like your personal space and your your person, especially like your bodily integrity and and um, and then out of this, at some point because of the association uh, of human beings together, civil society does emerge. And it's only in civil, civil society that a real psychology emerges where not only does the human have uh, a more proper of, of a love of themselves, but they, also, but they begin to think of themselves 
the self in relation to other selves and start to compare and start to have sort of uh, fantasy relationships with other human beings. And then this is where you get competition. Um, so the human starts to think of themselves as the way other people see them. And so you get this love of the image of oneself as seen by others. And that's what I mean by psychology. Of course, he doesn't have this terminology of psychology. This doesn't develop for another hundred years, um, the notion of psychology, but, uh, but he is beginning to uh, develop a notion of psychology. Uh, and this is where we get status, possessions, and property when we start to think of ourselves as the way other people see us and we start to uh, uh, get self-worth out of what other people think about us. And, and then it is a thinking, you know, like supposing what other people think. And that's why I say it's psychological. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, And so he, he does say something, uh, uh, here's a quote uh, within this discourse. He says, the first person who having enclosed a plot of land took it into his head to say, this is mine and found people simple enough to believe him. He was the true founder of civil society. And so he believes that the whole idea of property, especially enclosed, uh, an enclosure of the common uh, belonging to all of humanity. Uh, he believes that is a kind of um, ridiculous idea and requires a kind of con game uh, to convince people that this is a thing. It's like, that, you know, enclosing the common is not a thing, but somebody thought of it and made people believe it, you know. And, uh, and that's the beginning of civil society, but it's also the root cause of inequality. So all the inequality that we see in the world uh, and including like the slave trade, which was you know, uh, quite prevalent at this time, <clears throat> uh, slave trade in African uh, slaves. Um, you know, he, he's saying that that original idea of enclosing part of the commons is the beginning of all inequality that we see. And that's his big thesis, okay. Uh, all right, and then we have, uh, and then he, he elaborates a, a more, uh, he elaborates on the social contract then in 1762 and uh, well, well, maybe I'll, I'll cut this off and then I'll, I'll do this as a separate video. I'm trying to keep things short here for each video.